Good morning. This is the Great Guide Greet and Meet program that we are running for small businesses. And this morning we are with Abida Hendricks Lala, who is a psychologist. Abida has a practice called Cedar Psychology, and today we are going to be talking to her about COVID 19, the impact on people, the psychological impact on people, and more specifically children, as they are now heading back to school. Abida, thanks for agreeing to talk with us this morning. It's, ab it's an absolute pleasure. Abida, tell us a little bit about your practice, your speciality, what it is that you do. All right. So I'm a clinical psychologist and I have experienced both in the public sector and more recently started my own private practice. I just opened, I think, two weeks before lockdown commenced. Prior to that, obviously, you don't just start up something. Prior to that, it was a lot around um, building up a brand, um, working with different stakeholders. And then I ran one, two, essentially two workshops for parents and children. So that was quite successful. And then we were informed that lockdown was an imminent possibility. And we then tried to troubleshoot around that. And then the safest option was then just to cancel all of the sessions that we had planned for the subsequent months. And then just to put things on hold. So that oh, I, rem has been quite I remember challenging. You, you had a session that was going to be running at one of our local schools. It, it was actually in collaboration with Orion Institute. And the idea was to not just strengthen my own brand, but also to work collaboratively with small startups as well. Um, because that is how I essentially see myself and my role and and that is essentially the reason why i got involved in clinical psychology in the first place or at least one of the reasons um so i see it as a community and i quite like your your brand as well because that's essentially the ethos of um what you're about it's about a sense of community so that's quite great um my areas of interest varies because i've been privileged in that i had exposure in diverse aspects of um, society. I've been privileged in that I lived abroad for a little while, so I was involved in community programs over there. Um, so there's a big drive for community development um, as part of what I do. So yeah, that's been the driving force in terms of that. Awesome. So literally you are community focused and your ethos is about making a difference. Absolutely. Well, as much as I can. Abida, um, let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the impact on families, on individuals, um, and we will get to children as they're heading back because I think that the, the impact of, of COVID is kind of invisible when it comes to children because we think that we've sheltered them, we've kept them at home. And so I'd like to talk to you more, more explicitly about that further on in this interview. But let's talk about what you what you believe the impact of COVID-19, particularly currently as, as we're in level three and we've been through two months of, of literally self-isolation and then going forward, what it's what you think it's going to mean um, going forward for the next year, year and a half? So from a psychological point of view, there's been a positive in that I think it's highlighted the importance of mental health which if we, if we look at the, the allocation in terms of budget um, for policies driven through um, government, um, uh, Department of Health, et cetera, a small piece of the budget actually gets allocated to mental health. And it's one of the areas that is, it's been under prioritized for a very long time. And it plays out in terms of how community views mental health and the stigmatization around that. But essentially, if we look at, holistic development. So there's physical health, there's spiritual health, there's also mental health as a component of that. And I find that that has been the area with the least amount of focus. During lockdown, if we think about just Johannesburg and generally the, the understanding that this is the city of gold, it's the city where people come to for um, financial benefit and to grow their career, Essentially, it's gotten the name of being a rat race, essentially, if we think about it like that, right? So if we think about it, yeah. On rat race. <laughs> I mean, we, it's, it's even evident in getting on the highway. Um, people are basically tailgating each other at 120 kilometers, if not more. Um, so, I mean, it's evident on, on that level as well. 
So bringing our entire country to a standstill for essentially eight weeks um, brought with it, yes, the financial implication of not being at work, but it also brought about a time where people were no longer as busy as they used to be before, right? So what, what, what did people do with their downtime, right? Yes, there were people who self-soothed, there were some people who started eating more, and there was a, there's a lot of conversation now even on, on mainstream media around whether people gained or lost weight, right? Please explain, what is self-soothing? Okay, so when we feel um, or experience emotions, Often people are unaware of what it is that they are feeling, but it can be a, a discomforting sensation, right? And when we aren't aware of what we're feeling, we try and soothe through either, um, or one of the things that we tend to do is we, we have a relationship with food. When we consume it, it makes us feel good, but it's a temporary feeling, right? So when we make the association with this is something good and it soothes me, we tend to go to that, ex that, that experience when a similar sensation is experienced instead of getting to the root cause. Okay, so what I'm hearing you saying is that there, there's a, a physiological response to an emotional need. Um, so therefore, your endorphins, and your feel-good hormones are then engaged. Um, and that is where that addictive cycle starts coming in. I won't say addictive cycle, but where the reinforcement comes in for oh, gratification, whether it's temporary or not, yeah. Okay, so, so is, is that getting addicted to those endorphins, is it problematic and people get over it quite easily? And I mean, I'm thinking about myself now during this COVID thing. Um, yes, and you're sitting at home and you're bored and I'm bored out of my bracket and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what do I do now? And the first thing is I go to the fridge um, and I, I look in yeah. the fridge and, and that doesn't work. So I go to the cupboard and, and there I see the crisps big and juicy and, and lovely looking. Um, and, and suddenly I, I'm feeling okay again. Um, and so the next time, the next time I'm actually feeling that, that feeling, the automatic thing is to go to that behavior where it made me feel okay again. And when you look down the road a week later and seven packet of crisps, um, yeah, uh, I'm looking at it and I'm yeah. thinking, do I have, do I now have a habit with regards to food as a result of being in lockdown and there was really very little else to do other than to veg, um, series binge and eat. I think absolutely. I mean, it's not called comfort food for nothing. Um, <laughs> it, it got its name somewhere. So essentially that's what happens. Um, so there's a link between um, the gratification we receive, so it reinforces making us feel better and boredom essentially is an emotion. Okay. So many people struggle with identifying what it is that they actually are feeling. Because unfortunately, not all of us have been reared in a way where EQ or emotional intelligence or emotional awareness was something that was part of our development. And obviously, to no fault of our own, sometimes our environment, it, it wasn't part of our learning process at that stage, right? So... If we think about that component and how it manifested through, um, through the lockdown, I think many people, again, try to default onto being busy. And I use the air quotes for busy because it's a time filler. It's also okay. a very smart way for us to avoid dealing with whatever we've been, whatever we've been trying to avoid. So okay. all the painful emotions, essentially. Yeah. Um, and while we were busy, it was easier for us to package it beautifully. Well, it's not on a level that we're aware, obviously, but um, where we package it and we left it there. And if you think about being free for eight weeks or not being busy for eight weeks, it meant that we started reflecting, we started thinking about things. A lot of people have tried to develop themselves in areas where they were unable to before because they were just so busy but it also left many people being confronted with the very um, experiences that they've been trying to avoid and if we think about our context in South Africa with high levels of violence and trauma unfortunately for many it was around it was centered around those kinds of experiences so in other words um, um so in other words if you went into lockdown and you were having that you were having let's say relationship issues and things were not happy 
Um, literally, the, those first couple of weeks were, were awesome because now you had a lot of free time. You could literally smell the roses in your garden. And then it gets to a point of where, okay, you've done that. What now? You start reflecting and all of the stuff that you, you were managing to, to stuff down emotionally now starts yeah. bubbling up because now you've got all this time and you've got nothing to do but think about that. So it, did, so it, it creates hot houses um, of emotion. Okay. And, and from yeah. that, we obviously through the numbers, we've seen the, the figures. And unfortunately for some people who have been in um, abusive relationship or gender-based violence or child abuse or any kind of, of violence, now is it, during the, the lockdown, they're essentially stuck in their home with the perpetrators. So on that side of the spectrum, that has also been, we've also been seeing quite an increase in terms of those experiences. Um, so on, on, on that side of the spectrum, it's also been quite um, scary. Um, and it's also been confining people to a very dangerous space. Abida, obviously now, you know, we all as human beings develop at, at different kind of rates and speeds and we think at different rates and speeds and, and process things um, differently. Yeah. So, you know, maybe some people have actually managed to get through the eight weeks without incident, but they're sitting yeah. on, this, on this quagmire of, of emotion that is threatening to spill over. In, in your professional opinion, what is your advice other than first, obviously, to phone you? How can people actually start unpacking it in healthy ways that don't impact on the people and the kids around them? Building a level of awareness, it's always, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have time to reflect. But with reflection comes an unearthing of many different experiences. And I'm not advocating for everyone to go into therapy. I, I believe that we have the capacity to also self-regulate, so manage our own emotions. And we also have the capacity to self-heal. However, when it, when it gets to the point where it is spilling over and we are struggling to function in our day-to-day -day living, so we withdraw from social engagement with family, friends, etc., we there's a dip in our functioning in terms of work life. And again, I think these were experienced by many people during lockdown, and I think that was appropriate. But post-lockdown, if it persists, that would be problematic. And then at that stage, I would say, try and reach out and get professional help. So to answer your question in terms of what can people do, I think it's important, number one, and I think this has been the thing that's been quite helpful for many people, myself included, to, to try and maintain somewhat of a routine during this phase. And even while we are in, in level three, it would be important for us to feel as though we are competent, that we are, that we are able to achieve certain goals. And again, I don't mean an over flooding of being busy, um, but being mindful of setting maybe one realistic goal per day so that we have something to look forward to. And it's somewhat of, our, of what, what was our normal routine prior to lockdown. Okay. So, so that, that, that would be step one. The other thing would be to try and focus on taking care of yourself. And, and when I say self-care, I don't mean going for a manicure or a massage, which I think many people typically think that's what self-care means. Um, <laughs> and also... That's true. And also <laughs> or a jog. Exactly. Um, but self-care involves, again, like I said, also speaking to your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health. So being more mindful. And what that means is to be more present to what's going on around us. Again, to bring us back to reality instead of just being busy and a passerby in our lives. So when I say being mindful, I mean, when I go for a walk, um, obviously with my mask and conforming to all the, the, the legalities of stepping outside of your home, but it would be around when I go for a walk, it's not just to tick a goal off my list that I went for a walk. It's to build a more positive relationship with oneself, but also with the environment in which we find ourselves. So when I go for a walk, feel what the temperature feels like on my skin. Notice what, what the color of the sky. Absolutely. Look at the greenery. And again, not everyone is drawn to nature, but do what, what, what brings joy to you. 
So, but when you invest in, in engaging in that activity, try to be as present as you can. So again, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump to relationships. So you spoke about what can we do with our family, with our kids, etc. I think for many people, there's been a, a disengagement in terms of quality bonding with, with people that they care about. Again, if we backtrack to the busyness, yes. right? So for, for a typical person, and I, I don't mean to stereotype or anything, but I'm just generally, this, this is the, let's say you have a child, you in a committed relationship, you get up in the morning, traffic is horrendous in Johannesburg. So you get up at the, the, the crack of dawn, it's a rush, rush, rush to get done, sort out your kids, um, there's a rhythm in the home, you get in the car, you're on your way to school, do the drop-offs, you go to work, you have a busy day up until what, four or five o'clock typically. You leave, you're stuck in rush hour traffic. Um, by the time you get home, it's sorting out kids, it's seeing to your family, it's cooking, it's cleaning, it's, da -da 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 -da, it's all of these things. So what I'm saying is we don't have time to actually catch up with ourselves, right? So when you actually need a little bit of downtime, it's easier to say, Dinner's ready, everyone grabs their food, they're on their cell phone, watching Netflix, trying to, trying to just slow themselves down, right? But it's often more individualistic exercises. Yeah, it's, it's, not at, the, it's at the cost of the family unit. Yes. So again, I'm not saying that this is the case for everyone, but this has been the experience of many people. And I get life is busy. I'm not, it's not a point of judgment. It's just to what end are we willing to sacrifice being busy and productive um, in terms of quality relationships? So I think for many, this has again been an opportunity to try and reconnect with their loved ones in a more meaningful way, because essentially we were forced to do that too. Give me some examples of what it means to reconnect in a meaningful way. And I know that this sounds really obtuse, Abida, but you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you need to do this, but they don't give us the how. So I'm asking okay. you to actually give examples of some hows to, to help get those creative juices going. Practically, and I'm glad that you've asked that question because I'm, I'm more of what, what's practical. So we, we can give some tips, but obviously people need to adjust it according to what's going to work in their lifestyle. Like I yes. mentioned with walking, not everyone enjoys nature. So you need to find something that will center you and that will be meaningful for you. So with families, right? what would be a, a practical, helpful tip would be to find a time where most of your loved ones are together, whether it is in the evening, in the morning, whatever works for your schedule, and actually have a meal together or join in on whichever activity, but where you are engaging in it actively and mindfully, where you actually are present, not you sitting having dinner, the TV's on, I'm on my mobile for... I even grabbed my phone to just do this um, because then that, that puts those barriers in place. Even the fact that, that sometimes we bring our, our um, cell phone to the dinner table, it's easy for us to be distracted when we hear a ping or a vibration. So, so again, to be intentional or mindful about what we're doing would be to say, you know what? And again, I'm not being rigid about this. I think sometimes when people are on call or with, with something urgent happening, they'll be distracted even if they don't have their phone with them. So it's important to be flexible as well. But what would be helpful is as a family unit, whatever that cons would be constituted as, if you sit down and actually find ways around what would work for most of the family members and then collectively decide on committing X amount of time or activity to a joint exercise that, that everyone would partake in. So if you decide that that would be dinner time, having it um, every evening, and, and as part of that, we're gonna try and reduce the noise around us, so that would include social media, it would include Netflix, et cetera, et cetera, then that can become family time where we try and connect with one another. Try to understand what your day was like and not just, oh, how was your day? Be more intentional about it. Because if you're going to ask kids that, I think they'll just say, oh, it is fine. <laughs> so ask quite open-ended but specific questions. So if you know your child did gymnastics today, ask them, um, what was the easiest part of practice for you today? What was the hardest part of practice for you today? Um, try to, because remember also in our busyness, we sometimes autopilot through what we're doing and 
who just go through the motion. So it helps them be more present as well. Similarly for partners. So that could be one way of doing that. Another way would be what, what do we generally enjoy? If, if, if we enjoy dancing and being silly together, it could be so, because then you're ticking two boxes. You're ticking the exercise or the physical activity as well as the fun part and the, the, the engagement in family. It could be putting the music on as loud as whatever you, whatever is safely allowed within where you stay and just having like a free Do a dance party. out session. Exactly. I mean, why not? Reminds me of, of uh, Christina Yang and Meredith Gray in Grey's Anatomy when they would in dance. In the underwear. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, so here, here is um, an extended but very integral part of most families. Um, most of us have elderly that, have, that are also in our lives. And the impact on them has been particularly hard, especially if they're not staying with the family, as in mm -hmm. our instance, and trying to actually maintain that balance with regards to, to keeping engaged um, with, with your mum or your, your grandparent or whatever it is. And I have found that there's also been an emotional price and, and um, mental price your feedback for them in terms of, of what they need to do. Remembering, of course, that there might be mobility issues. You know, there, there, are, num there are a host of other additional things that come in when we talk about the elderly. It's, it's quite a difficult question to answer because one, I think at the beginning when you asked, you also said, let's talk about children. And one of the things that came to mind for me was essentially again, full circle, children and elderly at, at both ends of the spectrum. And, one of the key areas that, that I'm quite passionate about is geriatrics. Okay. And it's one of the, again, very under-prioritized. Yes. Unfortunately, in our context, it's, it's quite complicated. Okay. So with children and the elderly, they are vulnerable. I mean, general populations that are vulnerable with or without corona. With the added exposure with corona, they're even more vulnerable. Um, the concern in our context would be for elderly, um, as, because they're not often familiar with technology, it isolates them even further. The familiarity with technology, but also access to it. So many do not have smartphones. Um, many cannot afford the data cost as a result of it. So it isolates them even further, particularly, particularly during this time. If they are in a care facility, whether it's a residential facility or, um, or a group home, um, it, it's, I guess in those instances, it would be a lot easier because no one's really allowed in to come and visit them, um, but they are able to socialize amongst themselves and that's a lot safer. However, if you are an elderly living on your own in your own private residential um, home, it's a lot more difficult because if, even if family decides to go in to drop something, there's always a risk that you may be, you may be asymptomatic, but positive and you don't know it. And the risk and the fear of passing that on to your elderly vulnerable parent or family member. So for them, I think it would be incredibly important to whichever means that they are possible, whether it is through a landline, through um, a cell phone to whichever medium possible to try and connect with their family members and vice versa. Um, I think a, a telephone call or a phone call from a loved one speaks leaps and bounds in terms of connection. And that also speaks to people who are in isolation by themselves. Even uh, an adult that's, act, that's still working, it's still quite isolating to be alone. We weren't created to be, um, we are quite social beings. So it's quite difficult for us to be eight weeks completely cut off from and, and from also people. we tribal we our dna yeah. is wired to actually be operating within a group again to fast track because i'm just mindful of time as well yes. um how do we prepare children going back to school or even people going back to work i think one of the key things would be to to have a conversation with them to sit them down and actually talk to them in in fact the entire family in terms of how has this actually impacted you? Yeah, and, and, and How, bring, bring up the fact that it's okay to be scared. Exactly. And if we think about it, our response to corona and the lockdown has been very trauma and fear-based. 
So children naturally, when they look at, at, at what's going on with social interactions or cues, they learn. And they can also learn fear habits or, or to fear something. And essentially, coronavirus is a threat. So our reaction to this would be appropriate to be in fear of, but not to the point where it's going to be affecting your functioning. So if we think about children, I think it would be important to acknowledge and validate how they feel around um, going back to school, seeing their friends, the fear around corona, and then to make, especially this weekend, to prepare them to be more comfortable with wearing the mask. Because I imagine many parents would, leave, would have left their kids at home if they needed to go to the store. And there's a whole procedure when they get home in terms of disinfecting, sanitizing, etc. And kids see this. So for them, we can only imagine the level of fear and anxiety that, that they have as, as a result of the way that we've been engaging with the world. So again, it would be important to talk about how, how are you feeling about going back to school? What are your fears? What are you concerned about? And to actively talk through these things and just to monitor them to see whether they are withdrawing are they regressing or going back to previous stages that they've already mastered? So for example, if they are now um, potty trained and all of a sudden they now start bedwetting or having nightmares, et cetera, or not wanting to engage with anyone, or there's a, there's a drastic change in behavior. These are the things that parents actually need to monitor and just to talk through both with the teachers and with the children. And if okay. indicated, then seek professional help. Abita, there's, there's a question that I have because I've noticed um, through friends of mine and their kids um, a huge dependence on, on technology and entertainment online. There's been a dependence in terms of entertainment online and actually dealing with that online to the point of where I've noticed that kids are kind of hanging out in their room for, for hours and hours and hours on end. Um, what is yeah. your recommendation with regards to now? Because now that's a new habit that's developed. You know, they'd get up, be at school by quarter past seven in the day or half past seven, whatever it is, go through the day schooling, get home, do homework, and then maybe have an hour online. Now with COVID, they've actually been online and a lot more. Um, and parents, because of the fact that they're saying, oh, shame, they under isolation, life isn't normal anymore, um, we'll just let it slide for now. But now there's, after two months, there's a habit that's been entrenched. What is your recommendation to parents to, to now actually start um, getting their kids unplugged and back to normal? This is quite a difficult question because before I would have said it, it's, it's helpful to limit screen time, right? That, that's what I would have said. But now it is a necessary in order for them to bridge the, the, the barrier in terms of social connection. And we okay. know how important that is yes. developmentally yeah. for children to feel safe enough with their friends, to feel connected with their friends. So if that's cut off, if they already have screen time for eight hours of the day because of academia, it already exhausts them because of the lighting of the screen, because of it, having to engage in a different way. And I'm sure we've realized it as well. What we can get done in the office in an hour, you now need to plan meetings, have meetings about having meetings. And at the end of the day, it took <laughs> four or five hours out of your day. So what has been happening is people's boundaries have become blurred. We feel more exhausted emotionally, physically, psychologically, because it's just taking up too much of our time. And it's difficult now to say no when there's an increase in workload because we think to ourselves, oh, I, I should be grateful that I have, a, I have a job, I have an income. Kids are thinking the same thing. I need to get through my trick, so I'm going to push harder, I'm going to push harder. But it's going to get to a point when it's going to be too much. So it's also about trying to maintain, maintain a semblance of this is work and this is this is school so, so so you brought something up to in my mind when you when you said it it gets to a point of where it's too much what do those signs and signals look like for parents okay so sleeping patterns are affected or you are constantly tired um, appetite completely changes so when you notice especially with appetite people say yeah i eat but appetite is when you actually feel the need to eat, not just because we are sitting down together. Notice whether your child withdraws for the entire day, even when, the, when it's the weekend and it's not school, there isn't schoolwork, and they don't actually engage in anything besides just being alone. 
also watch out for dips in their mood, right? Because these can be reactions to being in lockdown, which would be understandable. But if this persists post lockdown, then that is something to actually be concerned about. So, so to answer the question that you asked earlier in terms of what can parents do, I think, again, it's about building that safe space with your children and connecting with them in ways that's not just digital, that they can have fun without just being in, without just being in a digital space. And it's also maintaining the physical socialization. Okay. And also um, having those, those honest, open conversations, talking. Yeah. Um, because I've noticed that, you know, after week one, it's great. We're all together. We're talking and we're talking well. Week two, yeah. um, there's a little less to talk about. Week three, there's even less. Week four, we're not talking at all yeah. and we, we don't talk anymore because now our experience is the same and literally we're in self-isolation and what is there to talk about? So it becomes yeah. more difficult and now we have to restart that whole engine again. And, and also it's about talking with not talking to. Okay. So with children, to invite a conversation where they're not going to be judged, where obviously there are boundaries in terms of what's okay, what's accepted and what's not in terms of behavior and all of that. But I mean, inviting that space that no matter how bad it is or how, how you think you may disappoint me, let's talk about it and let's see how we can correct it together and work on it together. I think that's a, an important part. And during this time, it's also important for parents not to just show the best foot forward that they're coping, but to also say, you know what, this is tough and it's tough on all of us. I think it also allows the kids to see that it's okay not to be okay. And I okay. think that's a very important message. In terms of, of extending your help to the community, and I know that you operate in our community, how would, how would people get hold of you? Where would they get hold of you? Okay. So during the lockdown and to alleviate anxieties people are experiencing, we are offering online um, therapeutic services um, via Zoom, etc. And I know we just spoke about digitizing too much, but I think it's also ne quite necessary <laughs> at this stage. Yes. Um, so they can contact me and we can see if, how we can actually assist and work together. So people can just... Um, reach out, Google, get my contact details, and then um, we can be in touch and talk. Okay, um, so that so is CEDAR, spelled C-E-D-A-R, psychology, yeah. normal way. The way if they wanted to get hold of you right now, they could pick up the phone and dial which number? It's 081-721-8123. All right, and mail? It is Abida, so A B double E D A H at tdpsychology.co.za. Abida, thank you so much for your time this morning. Really appreciate your helpful advice. And if there is anybody out there who feels that they need Abida's help, she's there. And as you have seen and experienced, she's incredibly practical and lovely to talk to. From TGG Jumpstart uh, Greet and Meet program, thank you for joining us in Abida Hendricks Lala of Cedar Psychology this morning. And we hope that this has been helpful for you.